people in Taiwan notify, um, I think it was Albert Lin. Um, so then they, um, they call me and then they actually drove to, to visit me at night uh, and uh, to tell me about this. And they started a prayer meeting at the church. And so we, we started to call Taiwan and then see uh, what we can do and then to understand the case because we didn't, we, we knew that he was arrested, but we didn't know what was the charge. Uh, so originally it was illegal entry and then become sedition. And when he was became sedition, it was very, very serious because minimum is it's 10 years or it could be life in prison. When I was charged with sedition, they moved to the Tu Chen detention center because that was to be tried by the high court, not by the local court. At the Tuchen Detention Center, they put me in a totally separate building and by myself. There was another political prison at that time, Xu Xinyang. We were all in solitary confinement. Video camera directly watching. Uh, the light doesn't go off. at a fluorescent light that's there uh, all day, all night. And so that was uh, solitary confinement. But I did a lot of reading and did a lot of push-ups. <laughs> there were people calling me from states and from different countries, even in, from Japan, they wrote me letters, uh, sent me fax and called, and they all want to help. Uh, Gary Van de Wee, uh, a Dutch person, uh, he was very supportive of the Taiwanese cause. Uh, he rallied his uh, church and they sent postcards from Nassau to Taiwan prison to support Columbus. And it was like 3,000, 4,000 cars. <laughs> I, I'm always uh, very thankful and grateful to many other activists before that were very brave. They stood against tyranny. They came out to speak. They work for Taiwan's democracy or basic uh, human rights. They were in prison. They were beaten up. Some people were murdered. Some people lost their life. Many people lost their, all of their belongings. And even their families were in danger. Uh, Du Xiuyi, uh, when he was in prison, that was before me, when his wife took his the baby that was having a high fever to a doctor, the doctor treated them once, then told them, told her, don't come to see me again. Your, your husband is a, a political prisoner. So that's what other people endured. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it, it was, um, I mean, now look back, it's, uh, I think we were lucky. I was lucky because uh, I wasn't alone. Um, Many other people, one by one, also broke through the black desk and appeared in Taiwan, including Guo Beihong, the person who went in Taiwan, escaped from being surrounded by 6,000 police and back to, uh, back to the U.S. Professor Li Ying Yuan, uh, he went to the Taiwan and was all over Taiwan taking pictures until Almost one year later, when he was arrested, there was the Wang Kanglu, uh, Wang Kanglu, who gave up a high-paying job in the U.S., went to Taiwan, became Wu Fei's. So Wu Fei did successfully move the headquarters into Taiwan. He was the general secretary, but died in a mysterious, very suspicious uh, car accident. The uh, head of Wu Fei, Zhang Chanhong, uh, Professor Zhang Chanhong, he later became Tainan's uh, mayor. He also went into Taiwan. They were arrested, they were in prison, but one by one, it was like unstoppable. And eventually in 1992, the KMT announced they were ending the blacklisting policy, except for a few people. <laughs> but through all those efforts, you know, if, if we didn't do anything, it wouldn't have happened as quickly, but I think because many people got involved, we were not alone in this.